Hey guys and welcome to the show. I'm at the beach and uh, today we're going to talk about DevOps uh, and containers. Should be an interesting show. I've got kind of my favorite container right here. Oops. Hi guys and welcome to the show. Um, today we're going to talk to Rosie Race about uh, DevOps and uh, containers. We've done some container shows uh, in the past, uh, uh, but this one's going to be a little more in depth and uh, actually we have a lot of content here. So we're going to probably end up breaking this up into several sessions. Uh, but without further ado, let me introduce Rosie. Rosie, what's up? Hey Alex, how are you doing? I'm doing good, man. Well, so today we will actually dig into the DevOps and containers, and um, I will start by looking deeper into the containers first. Uh, we will learn a little bit more about Windows containers first. Then we'll look into how you can put things into production with containers and regarding CI, CD, continuous integration and deployment, some of the toolings that we provide, um, Azure Container Service, and finally, a little bit around the monitoring and analytics through the OMS, which is the operations management zone. So, it's a it's a dev it's a it's a demo rich kind of a session. So I have a PowerPoint, but that's for the structuring and sort of like letting us into that demo. But I would say eighty percent is demo hands on. That, that sounds awesome. So one thing that I want you to do for us just because we've got people that may not have seen some of the other episodes. Let's let's kick this off by just describing what a container is and how it benefits a customer. Um, sure, so um, basically the idea behind the container is that, that well, traditionally we always have virtual machines. Um, there's a proven design. You can scale pretty well with that. But the problem really is that, that uh, if you really wanted to scale beyond the basic parameters, like you wanted to run, let's say, thousands and tens and thousands of VMs, the infrastructure and the performance and the cost of that is not necessarily feasible anymore. So in order for you to scale more than a VM, uh, the containers were introduced, uh, well, actually they exist um, for a while now, but uh, a company called Docker a couple of years back uh, bring an API structure around them and that basically led to like a mass adoption of containers um, and Microsoft uh, work with uh, Docker as a company um, and we bring in support for uh, in the form of Windows containers that are native to Windows uh, we support them in Windows Server 2016 um, and the client side we support them on Windows uh, 10 so um, uh, I mean in this session, we will actually dig into Windows Container quite a bit. Now, the benefit of using Container, um, beyond all that, the cost is that uh, the code that you write on your machine, and then you build it, and then you want to ship it, traditionally, the, the problem is that the dependencies are different in different environments. So when the environment changes, there's a high potential that your software will break. And especially with the services-based architecture these days, it's not necessarily easy to do that in a in a regular rhythm. So containers fill that gap pretty well. So you package something in a container and that container is basically going to remain the same. The infrastructure may change because in production you may want to run a much more beefy infrastructure. But the idea here is that, that what you write and how you package it, that piece doesn't change. All environments are going to have the same. So that argument that, hey, it works on my machine and, well, it's not working on your, that one is now very minimized. So I think that's a, that's a huge gain when you work on the container. Yeah, that's awesome. So a little bit different than a VM in that everything that that application needs to run is stored within the container itself. Yes, it's uh, basically a unit of deployment, too. So everything is self-contained within a container and... Uh, because of the way the way the container works, um, it's super fast to basically kick start a container compared to a VM. Uh, now there are pros and cons, and we'll dig into that a little bit. Uh, when you when you have such a performance gain, there is something that you have to forfeit. So traditionally, uh, if you look at the Windows container, we have 
a regular container, which is basically shared kernel uh, with the same base host process. Uh, but if you wanted to have a higher level of isolation, you can run what we call a Hyper-V container, which have the separate kernel for each container. Um, so how would we do this? Um, we can jump into a PowerPoint, and I have a sort of like a demonstration for that. So this is like a snapshot view. So you can see that the traditional virtual machines. So you have hardware, you have virtual machines running, usually multiple virtual machines on a single hardware. And with the containers, the idea is that, that you don't necessarily have, per se, the VMs, you have the containers. So, I mean, if you look at it from a high level, they, they look pretty much the same, like you replace virtual machine with a uh, with a container, but you notice that they share all the same kernel. And because they share all the same kernel, they are running in the same kernel base. Uh, that's good because it helps achieve certain performance enhancements. Uh, with Windows container, we have the same concept. Uh, you have the shared kernel, but if you wanted to have higher level of isolation, you can have what we call Hyper-V containers. Hyper-V containers are basically isolation and still give you better performance um, over a traditional VM, but uh, there will be some hit because now there is independent kernel running in the, in the container. Now, I worked with a couple of customers recently and they were looking into both and there's conversation like when we should use which one, and I think there's a broader discussion, but the reality is that, that typically the Hyper-V containers, uh, if you have a multi-tenant applications that are hostel, uh, meaning like if you are running container-based environment, providing different, uh, you, you have a hosting, you're like a hosting provider. So you wanted to have some degree of isolation if there are multiple tenants running their solutions on it and they don't want any um, a, a, any shared kernel there. So there's a, there's a little bit of that. But typically, I would say start with the regular Windows container, and then if you have a need of isolation, then go towards the Hyper-V, and it will justify the performance. Um, you have to fulfill some performance, so it will justify that. So what are we gonna do now? Um, let's go and talk a little bit about what type of container images Microsoft um, ships um, as, as a base image, and then how you can leverage them uh, to actually build something a little more substantial. So we'll start with server core. Um, server core and the nano server are the two uh, base images in Microsoft ships. Uh, then you can use the, uh, like IIS, which is the web server. Uh, you can actually run web server, uh, both in nano and server core. I will run in Windows server in the demo. Another big area of investment is how we can actually bring the existing tools and uh, technologies, like for example, SQL server, uh, that supports the container platform because the reality is that majority of the customers uh, wanted to use these uh, technologies and wanted to uh, get benefited from containers too. So the idea here is that, that um, you can actually run SQL Server inside a container. Another thing we're looking to is um, that how you can containerize an existing ASP.NET 4.5 application. So there's another very common ask that, that because customers have been using .NET for a long time. They wanted to uh, retain a lot of these applications while they migrate or for the greenfield development, they go towards the ASP.NET Core. So this is a great story for the customers because we do support not only just .NET 4.5, we also support uh, .NET uh, version 3.5. So um, how you can do that and then finally look into the ASP.NET Core application uh, which is definitely, I'm very really excited to show you, is sp.net core 1.1 application. So with that, what I will do is, I will switch to the virtual machine, uh, the demo virtual machine, so I will stop this. And this is the virtual machine that you have. Um, this is Windows Server 2016 with containers support on it. Okay. So. The first thing I will do is I will go ahead and just do um, Docker and it will basically show me all the commands here that I have. So that means that the Docker command line is working fine. And then um, what we will do is, um, if you notice that I have um, some of the demo folders here, uh, we will start by looking into 
something really basic, which is the nano server itself. And I think it's important because some of the some of the audience member here probably don't know what nano server is. So the nano server is really a slim, nimble, small, as small as possible uh, server with with a kernel and very basic set of services running on it. That's what it is. And it's a perfect fit for containers because what you really want in a container is it's a single responsibility principle, basically. Um, one particular set of responsibility per container. And nano server does not come with any UI. There's, there's no extra fluff in it. So it's a great fit, especially for the greenfield development. So uh, we start by creating a container um, with um, with nano server as a base image. And that's what it's gonna be. Uh, then we'll create something with Windows Server Core, which is um, basically like a regular Windows Server 2016, uh, but it's still better performance when you run it in a container. So let me do this. Let me go in, and so I also have this in case I, you know, need to copy something because I want to write so many commands. Um, let me scroll up a little bit. Yeah, here we go. So in order for us to run. This is the way the Docker commands work. So I will just go ahead and copy this. And let me know if the font need to increase because this is a font size usually works best. Uh, okay, so let's paste this here. Well done. All right, so that doesn't work. <laughs> okay, all right, here we go. So what I'm doing over here, so Docker run, meaning like I am telling Docker to go ahead and run a container uh, based on Microsoft Nano Server image. And IT really means that interactive. Uh, so there are two mods that you can run containers in. One is the interactive mod. So basically as soon as I run this container and then I tell it that run PowerShell inside that Nano Server, it will give the control to that particular program and then I can use that. If I use the deattach, it will actually run it, um, run it as a background process. So in this case, I will go ahead and run this. And this will actually go in. And now we are inside the, uh, the container itself. Now, the first thing you will notice that if I do the host name here, it's, a, it's a basically uh, the container ID. So this is not like a user-friendly name. And this is a typical thing because containers, the way the containers work is that you typically remove them and create new ones. You don't necessarily have the same affinity to them as you have with the VM because you will see that, that I can run multiple containers side by side without any issue. Uh, and you don't necessarily want it to associate names or particular IDs to them beyond just like a like this random sort of like a string here. Now just to make sure that uh, the the host name of my uh, of my host is this because I'm running a VM, so I give it a reasonable name here. Um, and we'll do this contrast because uh, when I go back and forth from a container back to the host, you know, it can be a little confusing. So I want to make sure that we're always going to do that. So right now I'm running um, in this Docker container, it's a Windows container, and um, I can do things like IP config. And it has an IP address here. I can also do things like get process. And um, it will give me all the processes that are running on this container, which is basically running a nano server. And you notice that, I mean, it has some basic services, like for the login, we run the PowerShell here, and some basic services here, but really not much. And that's the idea. Uh, now, if I go back, exit it, and let's give you a read up a little bit. And now this time I will run something different. Let's say we run the Windows Server Core. So I copy this. And it's again very similar command. The only difference here is that that we are now telling Docker to use Windows Server Core rather than the Windows like the nano server image. Um, now, before I press enter, um, I wanted to call out one thing here. Actually, let's do this. If I do Docker search and 
do Microsoft Windows Server Core, it will actually show me that um, in the public Docker registry. So this is the public registry where we have these images. You can think about this as a as a Git, uh, but this is for the images. And later on, um, in the other module, we will cover how you can create a private repository for the Docker images because you don't necessarily want everyone everything to be public. So anyways, so if I go here and look into Windows Server Core, you will notice that we have the Windows Server Core and the way we actually manage versioning here is through the tags. And you will notice that we have this latest one. So latest is, if you don't put any tag, it becomes latest. But we also have a very strict naming scheme. So we have 10.0 um, something and then different locales here, so on and so forth. So when I run this command, um, and if I go back and paste the command real quick here, what I'm telling Docker to go and if you don't have the image already on this machine, uh, go to grab the latest one. Although if I wanted to work with a very specific image, I can go and give it a number here like this, this tag. I will put in a tag here. So um, you can be very specific which particular version you wanted to work with. So now with that, let me go and run this and it will go ahead and launch Windows Server Core container in the interactive session. All right, here we go. It takes slightly more time uh, because you will see that it runs more processes. So now we do the host name again. And this is a, this is of course not my host. So you can see that my host is right there. And I can also do IP config and you will see that it has a unique different IP. Um, if I do get process here, this has slightly more processes, you know, it's still less, but yeah, yeah. slightly more. So the idea here is that, that there are certain applications that um, may require fidelity of like Windows Server um, and the other probably like ASP.NET Core, uh, they're very, very good fit for, uh, for Nano Server. So one thing that is um, great to, um, to look into with the Nano Server is that, that the footprint is small, the performance is going to be great, and if you're doing Greenfield, try to go with Nano Server. And if you have legacy applications, then most likely you have to use Windows Server Core because the services that they need are not necessarily available in the Nano Server. So, um, so that's sort of like a very quick overview of Nano and the Windows Server. Now, uh, when you install the or when you run Windows Server um, 2016 and um, add the support for containers, the, by default, Microsoft has uh, provided the Windows Server Core and the Nano Server image there. So depending on, um, de depending on like the latest build, you will get the latest image there. But you can always go and fetch a specific version, like I have, have it here. So if you wanted to do that, you usually do something like Docker pull, and then you'll say Microsoft Windows Server Core, and then the, the version. And version is literally reflected here in the tag, as I mentioned early on. Uh, this is critical because in any production ready application, you want it to have very, very specific versioning need. It's a nightmare to travel troubleshoot issues with containers if you don't have a proper ta uh, tagging. Because imagine, right, you're running thousands of these and if there's no tag, everything is not going to be that easy. So I, I learned that hard way. Uh, so, uh, all right, so with that, let's switch gears a little bit. Now what we'll do is that um, we will um, we will take a look at the ASP.NET 4.5 application and um, how you can package it up um, and run it um, inside a container. So you can do a lot of other things too. For example, later on I will show you how to run a regular IAS server and then you can put pretty much anything, a static HTML side. Um, it's a full-fledged IAS. So uh, traditional applications 
um, uh, to inside it. So you have that option too. But let's do a little bit more on the ASP.NET um, 4.5 uh, because um, it's highly likely that um, people who are watching this, they may be running one of like 4.5 uh, or even prior version in some cases. So I will go ahead and go into, okay, let me just do LS here, 4.5. So if you notice that I have a Docker file and let me open the Docker file first. So since we're doing everything current prompt, I will open the notepad even from a command prompt, how about that? Um, so this is the structure of a typical Docker file. So you start by telling Docker that which is the base image you wanted to use. Now we're using the Microsoft IAS image um, because ASP.NET Web Application 4.5 will need that. So it's a um, ASP.NET Core doesn't necessarily have 100% uh, um, um, association with IAS. Um, actually, technically speaking, even in the prior version, you can have a self-hosting. But um, the reality is that that if you have a full-fledged production application using IAS, you may need that. So we start with the IS here, and um, just to show you again the IS image here, if we go and do Microsoft IS, I doesn't like that for some reason. Okay, here we go. And this is uh, the image Microsoft provides. And um, Microsoft maintains it, and if you want to take a look at the, the actual Docker file for the IIS server, it's right here. So it's based on the Windows Server Core, and then what it's doing is that it's installing the uh, Windows feature, which is a web server. So basically, we're installing the IIS, and uh, that's just basically what's happening over here. So what I'm doing is that I'm telling it, no, I don't want to do this myself. I want to basically inherit. It's kind of an inheritance in a sense. So Microsoft produced this, and then I will go ahead, and in my Docker file, I'm saying, okay, use the latest version of the IAS, which let's, if you go back here, let's see which one is the latest version and how long, um, how far back it is. So last, updated the last seven days, so last week. No, I get that. I, I'm just I'm just looking at the number, and it looks a lot like a, like, you know, a build number for a version of, you know, one of our products or OSs. That, that's why I was asking. Yeah, in majority of the cases, it's like that. Um, and I mean, again, this is very interesting. Later on, when you when you see that for .NET, .NET Core specifically, yeah, you will notice that because .NET Core supports both is a cross platform. So if you look at the the tag there, which basically is, a, is aligned with the versioning, it will be for different for Linux and Windows. So that that is something a little more involved than you say that is .NET Core 1.0 or 1.1. So it's the build plus the version itself. Yeah, so I guess, uh, so if I built five containers, mm. all with, you know, based on nano server, they would all have different, they would all have different tags. They'd all have different IDs, different version numbers. If you, uh, so if you build a, okay, let's do this. Let, let's do that right now and I will show you. Okay. probably easier to show that okay so in this case what we are doing so let's go here so in this case we have an application uh, yep. this is this is a let me just show you what's inside it so this is a traditional application it's a it's a very basic application actually based on the default template that comes with visual studio and um, what we are doing is that we wanted to run this uh, in a container and we will give it a particular version, you know, when we do that. So before we do that, we need to write some instructions to tell Docker how to build that image. So in this case, the way we are doing it is that we are starting with the IIS as a base image. And then we are telling it that, okay, go ahead and install the .NET Framework 4.5. Um, and then make sure that you have the ASP.NET 4.5 support on it. So you do that. So you're basically running these commands when the build actually, when we 
run the command in Docker, it will go and execute this as part of the build itself, build process itself. And after that, we say, okay, so after the installation is done, copy the content of this particular folder inside that container image. And you can think about the container image as an independent operating system for that matter, for our context of this conversation. So what inside this one? So this is the entire content of the web. Um, again, this is one way of doing this. So we copy the content and after that, um, one thing I'm doing here is specifically, and this is a, this is one of the tip I will put it out there that um, remove anything that you don't need. So IS actually, if you use the default image, uh, container image from Microsoft, uh, I mean the default IS comes with the default website listening on port 80. So what I'm telling it that will just remove it. And it's a good idea because you don't want anything extra. So one container, one responsibility is a good theme to have. So in this case, I'm removing that. And then after that, I will tell it, okay, so go ahead and create a new website. And uh, well, of course, it's a container. So I need to use something a little bit more random. So in this case, we give it a good, <laughs> basically we, we, we give it a name like this. Uh, and then we open the port 80 and we basically just have the new website listing on port 80. So after that, we expose port 80 on the container itself. So when we, because remember, you're running multiple containers on, in this case, on a single VM. So the port, uh, the container expose, and then the host expose can be different. And we'll see that how it works when we actually run this container. But for this container, we want to make sure that, that uh, port 80 can take the traffic and uh, it basically lands on the website. So, so, so hang on. So are you saying that the that the host could be listening on port 80 and then you could expose a different port internally for this for this container? Yes, it doesn't have to be exactly the same. Oh, that's kind of neat. Yeah, um, especially on the host because you have to understand this is something you actually raise a very good point um, and we'll cover that later on in detail when we talk about the deployment itself in a cluster but uh, but the base point here is that that in the host, the ports are, well, if you take port 80 and associate with something, in this case, a container, it can be something else. Any process can take that, for example, right? That port is gone well, now. Port, port 80 is a well-known port, right? So, yeah. so clients know that if, they're, if they want to be served a web page, they, they connect to either 80 or 443 by default. Yes. So uh, that, that is sort of like a default for the web and for 434 like yeah uh, like it's a well-known port yes uh but you could ha i could have done like 9000 for example and that would have worked fine here you mean you could have exposed 9000 yeah i could have exposed nine so basically um because right now i'm running this on inside a container on port 80 i wanted to expose that port but i can do like 9000 here and expose 9000 that that would be perfectly fine and then on the host I will keep 80 and map it to the port 9000. Right, right. That's what I was getting to. Yes. All right. So with that, let me close this. And let's just clear it so we have some more room here. So the way you build these things is you do Docker, T-switch, actually build and the T-switch, and then the name of your container. Now in this case, in this example, we will run this locally on my VM. So I will give it, well, pretty much you can give any name. We can say ASP net, let's say 4.5 and um, app one or something like app. And this is where we can give it a version. So. This is again dependent on, I believe it depends on the, the conventions of versioning in a particular organization. So I can do V1 because this is the first time we are building this. Um, I can just do one. It can be any string. I can do banana, not necessarily. Okay. String. Yeah, so banana. you know what I mean? Yeah, banana. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I won't do banana this time, but okay, let's do this. Um, and it's important to put this like a, like a period in the end. So now if I go and build this, 
so what it will do is that um, let's just dissect this a little bit so every single statement here these steps are actually let me open it up side by side yeah 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 they map to the demo.txt exactly so it's basically docker file right here so it's um it's 100 mapping there um because i've been running these demo before a um, lot of these steps are cached so what docker does it it basically run a particular command and then it is basically create a layer and it cached it. So next time if you build and exactly the same, it doesn't have to do the work, um, which is great. So the build time decreased significantly. Word of caution, if you do this in production, then sometimes you want it to remove everything from the cache because the new build is gonna be significantly different. So it's great uh, for like productivity, but in certain cases you can actually force the cache to be um, to be uncached or removed. So what we did here, we go ahead, we get the latest, and then we did the copy, and we run this particular command for the website, and it should be up and running. And if I do Docker images, this will list all the images that I have. So um, the one that we created here is this one right here. ASP.NET 4.5 app, v1, and um, it basically based use the IAS. So you have one, this one, this is a sort of like a parent image, and this one is the, is the image that we just created. Now, if I wanted to run this, um, the first thing usually you want to do is that you want to do Docker PS um, to find out if there are any existing container running, especially on the same port, because if it is, then you just cannot run this. Um, new container on the same port. Uh, another handy trick is that that if you wanted to see all the containers that are stopped, because you can start a container and you can stop it. It's a it's kind of a similar to like you start a VM and you can stop it. So you can see that I have a couple of the, these containers that are stopped here. I can go back and start them, but right now they're not occupying, at least not running it. They're not running right now. So what I will do is I will do docker run and I will run this in a deattach mod. Um, I could do the same ID, uh, interactive if I want to. But let's do it in a uh, deattach mod, and then I will associate the port. So here's what I'm doing. Um, I'm telling the Docker to map port 80 on the host to the port 80 on the container. And we know that, that the container will be listening on the port 80 because we exposed that uh, yeah. in, the, in the Docker file. And then I will provide the name, which is ASP.NET 4.5 app. I could have done a better job in choosing the name, but um, but this should be this should be good. So now we'll go ahead and run this, and it will go ahead and start the, the container here. Um, takes a few seconds, and and here we go. Now if we do Docker PS you will see that we have the container running based on this image. So if I open the browser here, and if you go and, so how do you test it? Um, the way I'm testing it right now is I will go ahead and hit the, um, the DNS name of my VM, which is basically allowing me to uh, route the traffic internally to the port 80. Um, and port 80 is a well-defined port. Um, now while it's doing that, here you go. So here is your legacy 4.5, I shouldn't say legacy, it's traditional uh, 4.5 application, uh, plain vanilla application here. So you Correct. can go that out. Um, now while it's running here, how about we do this? How about we run well, another- Hang on, I've got, I've got one more question for you. Yeah, so, so On your command, you're mapping port 80 on the host to port 80 in the container. Yes. So if I wanted to have multiple websites, do I containerize each site or do I run IIS in a container and then build multiple websites in that same container? Um, let me make sure I understand the question. So you're saying that if you have multiple websites, do you want it to segregate them like one site per container or you want it to? Yeah, what, yeah in other words, what, because, because if, if I'm mapping port 80 on the host, port 80 in the container that means that 
every time a, a TCP session gets established with this host on port 80, it's going to map to to this one container, right? Because I don't see. Yeah. So um, two things. Um, the short answer is that technically you can do it. You can have like one container. Pretty much you use it as a VM. You can you can have like multiple websites running on it on different ports, and okay. then you have to find a way to map them. That's usually not the recommended way for many many re reasons. One is that doesn't scale very well. Um, right. Why? Because well, if you if you if you have a lot of things running in a container, you will pretty much end up the same challenges as a VM. Uh, two is you can do better. So in this case, if I want to run another container, what I will do, I will go ahead and let's say run this command and I will map, let's say in this case, port 9090. So what right. I'm doing is I'm running another container, the same web application, but this time I'm using 909. So I can keep doing that. So I can scale pretty well. I can same, sure. the same VM I'm running it. Yeah. But, but yeah, but the problem with doing that, here's the problem with doing that. Yes. The host needs to know that, that that is listening on port 9090. Exactly. Right? Or a client needs to know that, that that server is listening on port 9090. Exactly. So basically the way you solve that problem is typically you have a, well, you wanted to have a load balancer that is aware of your containers, basically. That's what you want. And there's a different okay. ways to do it, yes. So what you do is, um, and we will do that actually later on in the session. So when the traffic hits, it's a little bit on the infra side, on the dev side, uh, but it's important to understand. So when the traffic hits the load balancer, it has to basically go and route it to a well-defined port, usually, right? In a round robin scheme or whatever scheme you wanted sure. to follow there. Yeah. So what you want is that load balancer hits it and then uh, basically, at that point in time, there need to be a service discovery that tells it like which container listening to what port, because otherwise you don't have any means to determine where to send that request. Right. Something right. No. 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 I get that. I get that. But if I'm just establishing a TCP session to port 80, there's no information in that TCP header or in that TCP handshake that says I'm trying to get to anything except port 80 on this target box. So in other words, when I establish the TCP session, there's no way for me to, to distinguish between um, containers that I want to connect to if, if we're talking multiple containers that are hosting websites. Now what I could do in the browser is I could specify you know, the website name and then colon a specific port. And, and if I did that, that would probably work because on the host you could have that port mapped to a port that the container is listening on, and then that would work. Yes. So yeah. I mean, precisely. So if I if I can go in here and then just copy it and then paste it, and this time we use port nine zero nine zero, it should basically. Right. But that's my up. point. That that's the whole thing. That's what I was getting at. Is that you're having to do colon and then the yes. port in the browser. Yeah. You you typically don't want to do that at all in production. Like no. Typically, customer don't want to type in or remember even the port. Right. Yeah. So you that that's what I'm saying is that. Yes. So so that that goes back to my my point. If we have, and, and that this is why I was asking the question. Mm -hmm. If I build a container for each website, that means that in my container, don't do I have a, a separate copy of IIS running in each container? Well, you you need to run. If you need to run a IIS in every container, if your website really needs it, so that's a that's sort of hard requirement. How right, do you we're talking about? We're talking about multiple websites, right? So yeah. multiple containers, unless yeah. unless the recommendation is run one copy of IIS, build multiple websites in that container, and then just run that as a container. No, so that typically is. I mean, if you have to do it, you can do it, but typically that does not scale well. Um, there is the different ways to solve that challenge. Um, one way we're going to see actually in the next example is using something called Docker Compose that rather than me telling it here in a command line every time I launch the container, I will have yeah. a configuration file and then I will basically put things there and I can link the websites too if, there, if there's a dependency. 
So basically what it does, it basically help you exactly get away from the problem that you're describing. So basically, do you care? All you care is that, that you should be able to probably access this website without any colon and the port because that's just not right. good. So right. how do you achieve that? It depends on the infrastructure that you're setting up. So I can actually say, you need to have, again, a service discovery within your container of your service discovery within your infrastructure. So there are products like HAProxy, um, Nginx, especially Nginx Plus, that will do that for you. So you don't have to determine or you just describe, let's say, the port 80 on my container and then if you want to run 1,000 copies of that website for the highest scalability, the, the load balancer will know um, where to send that request. You don't have to type in like 9,000. 9, uh, port 80 is sort of like a bad example because port 80 is well, well known. Right. But let's say I want to run this on 9,000, but no, I don't have to put it here in the, in the browser. So or, what you're saying is it'll route based on the URL, not based on the, on the port that the client comes in on. Absolutely. I mean, client does not, when, when the request goes from, let's say, browser, uh, doesn't have to know anything about the ports. Right. So in other words, I establish a session to port 80. Uh, the load balancer accepts the session. I do an HTTP get. The load balancer looks at the HTTP get, looks at the website that I'm trying to access, and then figures out where that's located on the back end. Yes. And that back end story depends on the service discovery that is set up in your environment. There you go. That's exactly what I was getting at. That's perfect. Awesome. Okay. Um, great. So now what we have, uh, let's just do a quick recap here. So we have these two containers. So I know that because if I do Docker PS, I have these two, um, 9090 and 80. And um, actually, let me show you a command to, uh, to stop them and remove them. So... Um, it's a, it's a handy command. So you do Docker stop and you can provide, um, actually the way they do it, you can just provide the part of the image, uh, the container ID, and it will go ahead and stop that particular container. Uh, but um, another way to do that, if you want to stop all of the running containers, then you can do something like this. So it will basically get all the container IDs and then go ahead and basically stop them. And when you stop them, if I do Docker PS, you notice that there's no running container, but these are stopped. So it's just like I can go and start them again. Um, so here you know that, right? So these are the ones that we ran. Now, if I wanted to remove all this, um, even I don't want them to be stopped anymore, um, I can do something very similar, but I will do the command rm, which is remove. And now if I do docker psa here, we don't have anything. It's good to do that because otherwise these things are there in the background and eventually you will start hitting a little bit on the performance. So, yeah. Okay, so let's do another. Um, let's jump into another thing here. So, Now, what we saw so far is mostly web-based. Let's go a little bit into the database side. All right, so with the database, there are a couple of things up front. First of all, um, you can run the engine um, and the database actual files inside the container if you want to. But typically, you wanted to segregate the two, and there is a good reason for that. Running an engine is fine, but if you bulk your container with the we, we all know how big the SQL file can be. Um, so if you segregate them and put the actual file, like the LDF, MDF file in the SQL case, outside the container, then first of all, your container launch will be extremely fast. Um, and the second thing is that, that the scaling of the container will be fast because you're not just scaling um, the files that you are supposed to be running the in the background, should be in the background, and the, the process should be running in the container. So the way you do it is you store the file on the host and then you read them inside the container. And the way you do it in the, um, in the container world is by using something called volumes. So you can 
roughly think about them as like a shared folder in this case that you're sharing something on the host and you can get to it um, inside the um, inside the container. So the benefit here is that that well your files can be actually you can run multiple containers and they can repurpose the the uh, the files too. This is exactly what we're going to do for the SQL because um, we wanted to make sure that that the container itself remains uh, crisp and small. Now. Um, for the SQL, uh, there are different versions of the SQL container images. Let me go here and talk a little bit about it because um, there is a SQL server. All right, there's a Microsoft SQL. This is hopefully gonna run. Okay, so if you go here, no, I don't. MS SQL Server. So we have a SQL for, um, actually for Linux. Um, you can run um, SQL Server on Linux now. Um, if you want to run it on Windows, of course, you can do that. And this is the Windows version. So we have the full version here uh, in the form of, um, uh, of a container. Or you can run the Express version. Um, the, the, of course, the, the full version is basically right now is the evaluation copy, um, and B, the size is a uh, considerable difference between the two. So this image is really, really big, um, and the SQL Server Express is magnitude less. So um, what we'll do is that, uh, let me go ahead and copy the command here. So this command is actually the similar command that we run in the first demo, except we are asking Docker to basically share the file. So on the host. So here we go. So if you go in, this is the SQL server. Yeah. And um, you will notice that I have MDF and the LDF files. So these are the yeah. two files. So there's a custom database that I have. Because when I run this container, uh, based on the Windows Server 2016 Express image, it basically going to have the master and the temporary, all the default databases. But I wanted to actually use a database that I can later uh, connect to uh, the website. Because remember, the website has this login and the register. Uh, but if I, right now, there's nothing in the back end. There's zero back end here. So we can actually connect um, a back end where the user information can reside. So essentially what you're seeing is that um, uh, you may be familiar with it. Microsoft has this membership database that is uh, the SQL database that comes with the ASP.NET, I think after 2.0, ASP.NET 2.0. So you can, I'm just using that um, in ASP.NET 4.5. So this is the LDF and MDF with few users already defined and we will actually go ahead and curate some more. So now to do that, let's go back here and clear this up. So this is the command. Um, I don't know if the notepad is a better way to dissect it or the PowerShell, but um, here's what we're doing. We're saying that um, it's using the port 1433, mapped to the port 1433. Um, you can change that if you want. Um, we're using the, the password here. Do not use this password. It's not necessarily a very strong password, but it will do for the demo. Uh, we're passing the environment variables. So the, the, the reason we need to do that because the SQL server image, um, it's actually not gonna run unless you basically give it a strong password and you accept the licensing agreement. So at the time when I'm running this image, I wanted to run the container, I'm passing this. So when the container runs, this will land as a parameter inside the container. And then I'm using this V switch, so dash V for volume. So this is the location. So remember, this is the location we saw uh, right here, LDF and MDF. And these are the files that I wanted to share. So basically, I'm sharing the entire folder here. And um, then I will basically attach the database. This is the, the JSON format command. And then I'm telling it that use the Microsoft MS SQL Server Express. And uh, this will actually, if I don't have it locally, local copy or the, in the cache, then it will actually go and pull it from uh, from the Docker registry. 
So if I go and run this, let's see. So once it's running, we will go inside the container, and if you see that it's um, it's running. So this is the ID. Let me copy this. And you can do a command which is docker exec interactive and uh, this will establish again the interactive session and we can do a couple of things. We can do um, SQL CMD. This is a command line utility that will allow you to run SQL commands um, against a SQL server and then you do, um, because we have to connect using the, the SA user account, um, so I will do this one. So it's asking for the password. All right, here we go. So we are now connected to the container. We're actually inside the container running the SQL command line utility. And I can start probing around a little bit. So I can say uh, select, well, let me just copy the command from here because it's just faster that way. So it's basically the basic DSQL commands here to start with. So it will give me all the databases that I have. And notice that the web app legacy DB, this is the database that we attach is right there. So how about we do this? We use the web app legacy DB. So it's not selected and we can do select name uh, from sister I think is the all right so these are the name of the tables that we have so you can see that we have a table called asp.net users so we'll go ahead and run a command like the email from so I wanted to basically list all the email because we'll be using those for the login. And we can say ASP.NET users. And these are basically the users inside it. Now remember, these files are right here on the host. So if I change them, the change will persist. Because anything that lives inside the container, um, and when you remove the container, the change is gone. So it's like very volatile in that sense. So especially in the database, you wanted to persist that information beyond the life cycle of a container. So you do want to use something like a, uh, like a, like a, like a volume to store that file outside. Um, another common purpose of volume is to use store logs outside the, outside the container because you may want to analyze them later on. All right, so right now I will just go ahead and exit it. So now here's the challenge. So how do I connect the website to this database? Because um, website right now is um, doesn't even know there's a there's a SQL. So what we do right now is we do a little bit of a hard coding and we'll resolve that problem in another example later on by well, using. The tool. So hang on. Yeah. So it's good that you asked that question because I was about to ask it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was about to be my next question: is do yeah. containers? Yeah. How do we get containers to talk to each other? Yes. Yeah. So. Okay, so there's a poor man's way of doing that that I was about to show you, but you ask intelligent questions, so I will skip that and talk about more intelligent solution. Yeah, um, so, basically, so I'm, I'm sure we could do it via the network, right? Yeah, I mean, um, let me show you something. Uh, easy to show that way. So, if I, if I go into this component here, uh, compose, and I do notepad. So, usually you do something like this. So what is this? Um, I'm telling it to run a web app here and provide the name of the image. We'll build that by the way in the next demo. But what I'm doing here is that that I'm, go ahead, the question? No, 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 I just said yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, basically what you're doing is that you describe services and within those services you basically say, hey, my environment have a service called the demo web app based on this particular service uh, image using these ports, the mapping. It depends on this particular service. 
demo web API, which is essentially an API, um, and it's based on this particular image, and it's running on port 9000. Now, what I can do is from this web app, if I wanted to connect to this web API, rather than using that um, like an IP address or FDQN, I will just use the name of this service. So rather than me knowing the specific like IP address of the FDQN, I can talk to this uh, because the Docker internally have the plumbing to discover this internally. Service discovery again is an important aspect of it. So you need to define something like that in, um, in, a, in this case is a YAML file, Docker Compose YAML file. So you do that and that's how the container talk to each other, typically. Okay. So, yeah. Um, does that make any sense? No, it does. That's cool. All right. So, um, I do not unfortunately have a compose file for uh, for this one. So, um, we, can, we can skip that actually. So, because next one we will cover this topic. Okay. But what I would have done, let's actually jump to another demo. I mean, otherwise I would have just captured the IP and connect the two. So, let's clear it up. And uh, now let's go and do exactly what I showed you. Um, let's have two applications as the ASP.NET Core 1.1 application. Um, and uh, we have a web app and then we have a web API. And the web API actually will basically just give uh, a JSON file with a famous quotes from famous people because that's a good thing. Uh, so we do that. Uh, but I will show you how it works. So let's take a look quickly into the actual uh, application. Okay. Okay, so we go in. So we have the web API and then we have the web app. Now, I choose this specifically because later on we will use exactly the same applications. Um, and pour them into literally cross-platform into Linux um, and put them into production. Uh, so this is this is important. Like it's a it's a great reusability story there too. Right now we're gonna run them in a native Windows container. Later on we will just copy and paste and put them uh, into the into the Linux. We have to go to the restore and publish again, but th that's something that this again is uh, is it, not gonna be did not break anything. So. What I will do is, if I go inside, if I do see my web API and do something like notepad docker file, you will notice that this docker file is actually much more compact. Um, but what it's doing is, is asking, again, the Microsoft.NET. So here is the .NET image. Um, and this case, I'm asking specifically for the nano server because the .NET is cross-platform, so the way the Microsoft manages the different versions, if I go here and put .NET, you will notice that the tags here for the Windows, the way you do it is, um, let me just search it real quick. Uh, Control F, Nano, here we go. So we have the Nano server, uh, yeah. which is essentially what we're gonna use. And um, if you wanted to run it on the, by default, um, uh, I'm pretty certain that it will um, it will fetch the latest one, which is the Linux base. So, so basically here the tag is important. It's even actually more important in the .NET case because, um, uh, because what happened in the last, I think six months or so, uh, as we go into from, so traditionally when we released it last year, we have a JSON-based project format, and then we move from CS, move from there to CS proj format. So you have to target a specific build to make sure that depending on which version you're using, if you're using 1.0, then you want it to have the container image uh, with a appropriate version uh, of that .NET. So it's uh, it's very important. So these things are like well documented too. So it's something that you spend time. Um, I'm basically using uh, a very basic application here and so it's 1.1, so I know that the latest version of the nano server will be good enough. 
All right, so um, as I was saying that we have the nano server here. So we have the base image .NET and nano server as a tag, meaning like we are basically working .NET in the nano server, which is the Windows server, uh, Windows container. Now after that, what we are doing is, um, this is specific to the .NET core. Uh, so if we go back, let me just go ahead and actually back in the PowerShell and do the listing here. And you'll notice that we have all the files needed that compose a .NET, uh, ASP.NET Core application, but we are predominantly interested uh, in only the published folder because this is going to have the files that will actually require to run with the dependencies. In fact, if I go in, and this is a, there's a lot of files inside it, so don't be scared. Uh, if I do ls here, you will notice that it has uh, the, the required files, uh, including the actual DLL or the assembly um, that, um, that, that we need. So if you look at the Docker file here, um, we will copy everything that we have in the published folder um, into this folder app inside the container. Now, in order for the application to listen to a particular port, we need to set this environment uh, variable. This is the way you set it in the, in the Docker file. Uh, and we basically open up the port 9000 here in this case. So this API is listing on port 9000. We expose it and then, then we're basically making an entry point, which is the entry point for the uh, for this container. And we're saying that, okay, so within the published folder, we basically have the actual DLL, the assembly, and go ahead and run that. Now, if you're wondering how to create the published folder and everything, you can use the the dot net command so you can use the dot net restore and it will restore the every single piece of dependency that was there so i will just do that um, and then you can do dot net publish and describe that which folder you wanted to put all the all the files in so in this case i will do published right here and that's how I actually created this on my on my system. So with that, so it seems like that, that this one is fine. Um, so I will do docker build. And um, what I will do is that um, if I go back here uh, real quick, um, I wanted to open that compose file, uh, the YAML file. So I want to make sure that I use the same name here. Yeah. Like copy this. Um, by the way, I can change it too because um, I may have it already created. So, uh, but let's just make sure demo web app and the demo web app. Okay, got it. So, demo web app and so this will basically build this particular image and um, it will go ahead, copy the folder inside, takes few seconds and eventually it will go ahead and have oh I just realized something so, <laughs> okay we can take care of that later so basically there's a typo there it's a web API not the web app so okay so let's do this all right it's fine um, so this is the web API and now if I go into the web app and let me clear it so it's easier to read. And I also have the the Docker file here. Pretty much same. The only difference really is that the name is different for the assembly and I'm listening to the port 80. That's the only difference. The same .NET Nano Server for Windows container and we're doing exactly the same. And if you notice that, if I close this, uh, we do have the publish folder here that we are interested in. So this time I'll go ahead and run this command again. And it will go ahead and copy the web app and create that. So now if I go in and do Docker images, we should have the web app and the web API. So um, there is a demo web app and there is a demo, um, demo web API. So now what I will do, and this is something different. So in all the demos before, what we did is we went in and we did Docker run. 
This time, we'll use this tool called Docker Compose. And actually, Docker Compose. And then pass it the file that we have. So uh, not pass it. Basically, we use a command called up. So it's really like you up it and you stop it. So it will read the YAML file and create the entire, um, run the entire container set for us. So in this case, what it will do is that it will go ahead and first create the demo web API, which is a service here based on the web API image, and then make sure it runs. And then it will go ahead and create the second service. And then basically this is going to start a container, the demo based on the demo web app. Uh, on port 80 and we should be able to use that. So let me do that. And again, I didn't provide any extra parameter here. So this will be all interactive, the same way the IT switch works. Uh, if I want D attached, then I should use um, the D switch. So you see it went in, created the API and then have the um, have the web app. So it's running now. So what I will do is I will go back here and here we go. So we have the web app and this is the ASP.NET Core. This is not little. And notice that it's a plain vanilla here. I just added one more view here, quotes, and it's basically listing the quotes from uh, people who are much intelligent than me. Uh, so that's what it is. And I can also show you the API here. Um, actually, this is the, the API. I think it's exposed. And it's basically giving me the JSON and I can open it up and well, let's oh, work yeah, look at that. That's cool. Yeah, so that's basically is doing that. Final thing I want to show you is that, that um, which is basically sort of goes with the question that you asked me, that we are not accessing this with this URL. We are accessing the API with the hand, the web app, uh, using pretty much this as a, um, as, 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 a, as a DNS name, demo web API. And just to show you that, um, it's a very critical piece of code. If I go into the web app, and go into controller. Oh, look at that. Isn't that good? Um, the days when you wanted to go, oh, right, this is <laughs> not good. But here it is. <laughs> here it is. Um, yeah. Demo web API. And basically, so we're not using this specific. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hosting. Yeah. That's cool. All right, so that's it for the demos. Awesome. All right, well, guys, this is part one, right? We've got three parts to this series. Um, and uh, Rozzy did an excellent job. Rozzy, thank you so much for doing this for us. Hey, thanks. Um, anytime. Looking forward for covering the CI, CD, and the other part, the ACS Azure Container Service. Yeah, man, I can't wait. I can't wait for part two and three. Hold on a second. Mm, that's good air. Um, well, still, HR will have some objections, I guess, but... <laughs> still, still empty, just in case anybody's wondering. Um, but I hope to change that shortly. Um, yes. <laughs> anyway, guys, thank you so much for joining, and uh, uh, thanks for watching this episode. And uh, remember, part one of three, that's your taste of premiere. <laughs>